Square, Jamaica Plain, where tonight on the Boston Neighbor Network, we bring you a two-part show. First up, we continue with our coverage of election 2014, a very exciting year, especially as far as state elections go. Uh, we're just weeks away from the state Democratic Convention. A lot of positioning, a lot of jousting for that uh, uh, endorsement, nomination. Tonight, you'll meet one of the candidates for Attorney General, an old friend at that. Uh, he was a former uh, House and Senate member, and uh, in 1998, the Lieutenant Governor's uh, nominee for the Democrats, and in 2002, a gubernatorial candidate. He's back as one of uh, two candidates running for uh, Attorney General and on the Democratic side. You know him, of course, Warren Tolman. And then on the second half, we'll shift gears to a, a local issue. If you believe my guest, uh, Southwest Boston could be clogged with uh, traffic if uh, the state goes ahead with some of its plans for redeveloping the Forest Hills area. Bernie Doherty from Bridging Forest Hills join us, joins us to talk about uh, some of the issues that he's been working on. All that and more tonight on Talk of the Neighborhood. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, we're back with Talk of the Neighborhood. I'm Joe Heisler, your host tonight, two-part show. And in this first half, we continue our election 2014 coverage. And uh, what a year it is, uh, a very spirited uh, gubernatorial race. But that's not the only thing on the ballot this year. Uh, also, constitutional officers, which have drawn some uh, very interesting candidates. And uh, as we approach the Democratic Convention coming up here in a few weeks, uh, the race is on, and tonight joining me, a uh, Boston boy, uh, he's a former member of the State House, State Senate, uh, former candidate for Lieutenant Governor in 1998, and uh, former gubernatorial candidate. He's come back after 12 years to uh, run for Attorney General. You recognize him, Warren Tolman, and nice to have you here, Warren. Good to be with yeah, you, nice Joe. Thank you. you Thank friend. you. Nice to be back. Yeah. Yeah. Still as handsome as ever. Yeah, you right. know? I mean, what can we do? It's all in the haircut. <laughs> <laughs> well, it brings up an interesting point. You've, you've been kind of out of the game for a while. Sure. Uh, what made you decide to come back? You know how tough a business this sure. is. Sure. Well, I ran for governor in 02, and, you know, I thought I was uh, probably going to step aside and not run again and, uh, you know, helped my kids with their homework, coached them, and went to their recitals and all that stuff, and they're older now, obviously, and uh, when uh, Martha Coakley decided to run for governor, uh, I got some calls from people like Frank Bellotti and Scott Harshbarger, former uh, attorney generals, who uh, suggested that I should really look hard and long at this race, and that uh, there was a lot of opportunity to do a lot of positive things on behalf of the people of the Commonwealth as Attorney General. And the more I looked at the office, and you know, obviously I had worked there as a complaint mediator sure. when I was in college, but... And you've been a practicing attorney this, right. uh, all the, this 25 time. 25 years, yeah. yeah. Start to think about the, the magnitude of the impact that you can have as Attorney General and some of the things upon which you can work. And the more I looked at it, the more excited I got. And, uh, you know, these are issues affecting Boston, but really affecting every community in the Commonwealth. So. Uh, I decided to uh, take the plunge and, and, and run and, and put everything aside. I left my law firm in, in uh, December and, and focused solely and exclusively on uh, trying to be the next Attorney General of Massachusetts. Well, and you see the kind of schedule it, it brings. I know you've had a really busy day today, uh, uh, jumping all up across the city, and including here in uh, Jamaica Plain for uh, uh, coming here, uh, uh, rolling out uh, some new uh, initiatives on domestic violence, uh, pay equity, uh, buffer zones. Yep. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, not many of these issues you've, you've uh, uh, dealt with before sure. and worked on yep. before, but uh, bringing them to a new level. Yeah, they, they, a piece today on women's issues. We toured Rosie's place, went to Casa Myrna Vasquez, uh, and sat down with some of the folks here to talk about domestic violence issues and the like. I, I was actually chief sponsor of the Address Confidentiality piece that's uh, saved lives of, of battered women throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, 
also uh, was a, one of the original sponsors of the buffer zone law, which is before the Supreme Court, as you know. So I, I have a record on this, but there's a lot of things we can do to make the lives of women in Massachusetts better and safer. And uh, those are some of the things upon which I want to work. And uh, with this week coming into Mother's Day, it is Mother's Day Sunday, Joe. I just want to yes, remind well, you of that. Yeah. Uh, but so, so be on your toes. <laughs> and and uh, uh, no, we want to talk about some issues affecting women. Obviously, as the, the, the wife of my high school girlfriend, 27 years. I mean, the husband of my high school girlfriend, she's uh, 27 years. She's been my wife and, and, uh, and the, the father of two daughters. Uh, and also someone who spends a lot of time with my 89-year-old mother-in-law. Uh, it's a big week, and it's a special week, but it's an important week to recognize uh, women and to talk about some issues directly affecting them. And, you know, I, I talk a lot, not just this week, but generally about uh, the issue of on-campus sexual assault. Mm -hmm. You know, we have some of the best colleges and universities in the country in Massachusetts, and, and I want to make them the safest. Joe, uh, it's hard to believe, but today a young woman is more likely to be the victim of sexual assault if she goes to college than if she doesn't. In 2014, that's a frightening statistic. Uh, my daughter's at BC now. Uh, everybody should be concerned about that. Uh, it's, 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 it's primarily, although not exclusively, women, uh, and we've got to do a better job implementing best practices. And the Attorney General of Massachusetts, which I hope to be uh, next January, can really change this and can really push uh, and, and implement well, best practices. Where do we go? How do we take the next? There's been some horrific sure. examples, not the least of, uh, well, uh, you know, it seems like uh, every other week, every other month, you, you hear of another example, sure. of not just domestic violence, but uh, violence that ends in homicides or, you know, great sure. bodily harm and, uh, uh, you know, it's a feeling of helplessness. Anybody that reads these articles, uh, because uh, many times crimes of passion, well, yeah, these aren't crimes of passion. These are violent attacks on, on women primarily. Uh, and specifically, what I want to do as the next Attorney General, I hope, is to call a summit, get all the colleges and universities there, talk about implementing best practices. I went to Amherst College. Um, my One own, of those uh, cited. By, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, had, had a difficult chapter. They've done some really wonderful yep. things. I think they've really turned the corner. The president out there, a woman named Biddy Martin, I think has been a real leader on this. The, the White House has consulted her about some of the experience, and, and, she, and they've learned. But, you know, Merrimack can learn from Amherst, can learn from BU, can learn, and all, they, all of them can learn to it. We could talk about bystander intervention. We could talk about training our campus police and our staff and our administrators, and also teaching young men and women about uh, what we can do if you see a peer about to get uh, assaulted or to get him or her out of harm's way. Uh, so there's a lot we can do uh, that, you know, ironically, the University of Montana is one of the leaders in, in, in this arena, as is Kenyon College, and New Zealand has some great practice. So let's get everybody together, let's learn from it, and let's get everybody moving forward. Uh, I want to use my leadership skills to change this, because this is a real plague on our society today. One out of four women a victim of sexual assault on a college campus, that's outrageous. The Attorney General's office and, and the Attorney General acting as a leader can really change this, this uh, approach to and, and help to solve some of these issues. Well, and and that raises an interesting point because, I, and I think a lot of people don't understand the role of the uh, attorney general. Uh, a lot of the work you do is on the is on the civil side. Seventy five percent. Seventy five percent. Various numbers, but uh, uh, so. Do you have a? Do, do you have to spend a lot of time kind of helping people kind of understand that because they of course see you as the uh, chief uh, law enforcement officer. You are, or? you're the state's chief law enforcement officer, also the chief uh, attorney. Uh, but, but you know, specifically, yes, there is a huge criminal component, but 70% of the office, 75% of the office is civil. You're gonna deal with health care issues, you're gonna deal with utilities, insurance issues, cyber crime, civil rights issues, uh, consumer protections, another big yeah. area. So. Yeah, I want to beef up our consumer protection uh, component. Just as people know about the treasurer's unclaimed money list, they ought to know that they can call the attorney general's office and help them when they get ripped off from that painter who shows up to the woman in Dorchester's house, takes her $5,000 check to never be seen again. Who can that woman turn to? Well, the attorney general's office is there for her, but not everybody knows that. So I want to beef up. That's an area where I worked when I was a, a younger man. Uh, and I think this area can have a, a great deal of impact helping 
women, uh, helping people in communities of color, helping people for whom English is a second language, and, and helping uh, the, the elderly community. So, and, and those are where these predators really start. This is where we can focus the, the Attorney General's office and, and discern patterns and practices of what these predators are doing. And they are, they're consumer fraud or consumer oriented pre predators. So we can help with that with a beefed up component of the Attorney General's office and I'm excited about that. When you think about this office and of course you, you've known uh, uh, you know, those that have served in that position and-, and I, I should stop you, know. you there, Joe. All four former Attorney Generals, all four living former Attorney Generals have endorsed my candidacy, which I, I'm very proud of because that's not a political endorsement as much as it is an endorsement of the person for whom they see best fitted to serve in an office which they care very much about. So I, I'm very proud of that. So, Sorry I, so I guess if I ask you who you who you'd model yourself after, you'd, you, you'd, you'd have a tough time answering. No, I wouldn't actually. I think Frank Bellotti uh, was just, uh, he, he is the father of the modern attorney general's office. He professionalized that office. The National Association of Attorneys General gives a national award, it's called the Frank Bellotti Award, uh, for the work he's done in furthering the offices of attorney generals nationally. So he was one of the people that called me and implored me to run. So uh, I'm very proud of that, but I'm also, uh, I, I think he, he stands, so I think Tom Riley and Jim Shannon and, and Scott Hoshbarg would all agree with that. Well, as would Martha Coakley. As you work for, wow. And interestingly enough, uh, your uh, primary opponent, at least, is uh, uh, Maura Healy, who works uh, for, or did work for, uh, the Attorney General currently. Does that uh, uh, put you at a disadvantage? No, I, I think, you know, I have an experience in the private sector, which I think is very important. I've been in the private sector for 15 or so years. I served up in Beacon Hill in the House and in the Senate for eight years. And I think the balance of the public sector and the private sector experience is, is very, very healthy. I also think at the end of the day, it's about my leadership skills, Joe. I think that my ability to drive a, and, and, and take on some tough challenges, as I did, I took on Big Tobacco before it was popular and uh, before they had been beaten. Uh, and, and set big tobacco back uh, and because they were preying on young kids, 90% of whom s started smoking before they reached the age of 19. Uh, Rush Limbaugh called me an anti-smoking Nazi on national radio. That's how well, I knew I was doing. Of honor, right? I knew I was doing something <laughs> right then. Uh, and the American Cancer Society sent me around the country uh, and, and to work with other legislatures about uh, you know what I could do and help and work with them on uh, sp specific issues. I also fought the campaign finance battles. You know, again. Uh, when it was tough sledding, the last campaign finance piece that passed up on Beacon Hill, an ethics reform measure, was my measure uh, that I was a chief uh, sponsor of. And, uh, you know, and, and frankly, I then ran as the only candidate to run clean statewide under clean elections. Right. And in, is in that still true history. to this day? Yes, yeah, it will be, unfortunately, because yeah, yeah. they repealed the law uh, until we get some type of public fin financing measure back. And I really think we need to address the pernicious influence of big money and special interests on the political process, the Citizens United decision, the McCutcheon decision. Is there anything a state attorney general can do about that? Uh, well, well, you can I certainly use the bully pulpit, uh, and you can advocate, and you can speak out. Uh, and certainly when it comes time to debate and discuss issues affecting campaign finance mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, you can advocate as well. So, uh, And if there are opportunities to challenge the constitutionality of some of the things that are done, uh, I will be there. I'll, I will be ready to do it. Just as, for instance, on the buffer zone law, if something happens, the Supreme Court's gonna make a decision. If, if our buffer zone is struck down, I'm gonna be ready to, 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 if I were Attorney General, I'd be ready to move. And if, if, uh, if we don't resolve it by next uh, January, we'll be ready to take action then. Which uh, is a, a possibility. Again, Warren Tolman is running for Attorney General, uh, one of uh, two Democrats in this race. Of course, uh, the primary, not until September. Here tonight on Talk to the Neighborhoods, uh, after a busy day, uh, around the city talking with uh, various groups uh, uh, regarding uh, domestic violence, uh, pay equity, buffer zones. Uh, uh, there was an interesting piece in today's Globe about the uh, uh, quandary, I think, well, I'm not, maybe that's my term, that, but that uh, Martha Coakley finds herself in the current Attorney General, uh, uh, you know, defending uh, a decision or a, a law as it relates to uh, casino gambling, uh, yet uh, professing, uh, well, I, I'm not sure what side of that issue she's on, but 
as you mentioned earlier, you are the state's attorney, uh, right. so to speak, and sometimes that involves uh, uh, representing the state in unpopular issues. Right. So, some, you know, certainly there are Ready issues. Ready for that? Well, you know what? If, if, if I find something morally reprehensible, Joe, uh, I'm not going to represent the, the Commonwealth. And there, there is precedent for that. And actually, the law says you don't have to. The Constitution says you don't have to. The interpretation of that by the SJC. I'll give an example. You know, I have a real hard time with the actions of the DCF. Uh, the, representing and defending these young children. The most vulnerable people in our society are these people, young kids who have nobody to stand up for them. Uh, they, their parents are, are wherever they are, but they're not uh, present and visible in these young children's lives. And DCF is entrusted with the responsibility to take care of them. And the, you know, sometimes I, the, with disastrous results. As absolutely, we've as we've seen. And, and so I get that there are problems with the financing and the funding of the agency. Uh, so I would advocate for you know reducing caseloads for social workers and the like, but I also am not going to stand for this type of neglect for some of these kids that have, has taken place. We can't defend it. Um, we've got to. I got to be there on the, the side of these kids uh, first and foremost. So yeah, there will be some issues where we'll differ. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to take the attorney general's office in a little bit of a different direction than. Uh, some people have, and you know, I'm going to take on the NRA. I fought big tobacco. Uh, I want to advocate for the, enforce the implementation of smart gun technology on the sale of all new guns in the Commonwealth. This smart gun technology, Joe, I don't know if you know, it's, it's the fingerprint technology mm -hmm. on the gun handle. It's your gun. Won't fire unless uh, it recognizes the. It uh, recognizes your fingerprint, or if you want five people on it, you can you can put, tell the chip to recognize these five fingerprints and bingo those five people can, can fire the gun. Uh, it's basically about making our community safer. I hope it'll cut down on gun trafficking, but I know that just as we saw with the 15-year-old you know, boy who shot his brother in Dorchester, you know, some of these lives could be saved. There was a, a four-year-old uh, that was in the New York Times yesterday that, that shot his eight-month-old brother uh, just a couple days ago. So, you know, I know that the, and I, the Attorney General of Massachusetts can force the implementation of the smart gun technology on the sale of all new guns sold in the Commonwealth. It's a big area of difference between me and my primary opponent. She says we can't do it. I say absolutely, not only can we do it, we must do it. I get that it's taken on the NRA. I get that they're a vociferous and, and, and uh, significant opponent, but this is about saving lives. This is about making our communities safer. I'm ready to do it on day Even one. if it's uh, sometimes uh, butting heads with uh, an immovable object? Uh, well, it, oh, it, you, you, you do have kind of a hard well, head well, there, it looks like. I took on Big Tobacco, and, 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 and I helped with a lot of friends in the legislature. We beat them. Uh, this is one that the Attorney, General's, Attorney General can force the implementation of with no new laws needed under existing regs and existing laws that have already been passed, the Attorney General can take on this issue and force the implementation of the smart gun technology. And it will save lives. It will, and the NRA is aghast at this. It, it's, this technology, by the way, was developed 15 years ago. Uh, and Smith & Wesson wanted to market it, and the NRA and the other gun manufacturers organized a boycott of Smith & Wesson products. Smith & Wesson's stock started to tank, they shelved the technology, and there it is languished for 15 right. years. So we can do a better job, and we can force uh, the, the implementation of this smart gun technology. It, frankly, Senator Markey has filed similar legislation down in, in D.C., but unfortunately with the stranglehold the NRA has on Capitol Hill, it's not going anywhere. Maybe state action. Uh, I, you talked about uh, your primary opponent. And, uh, how else do you differ on are you different than her? And, and so how can people, voters out there, trying to decide who to vote for? How can they differentiate? Well, I, I hope they'll look at my website, warrentolman.com. But, but, you know, also, it's, it's about leadership. You know, I, I'm going to tackle some problems that, that I believe need to be addressed and haven't been addressed. Uh, the opiate scourge that, that afflicts, afflicts all of our neighborhoods, and which has been a priority for me, for my brother, for, for Mayor Walsh, and, and, and a lot of leaders in, in the community. Um, mental health parity in 2014, Joe, is the law of the land, except it's not. It's not being enforced. And uh, when someone shows up, as this young woman in Taunton did, uh, twice she overdosed within a five-day five period uh, a couple months ago. 
The third time she showed up, uh, unfortunately, was her last overdose. They couldn't find her a bed the first two times. If she had had a heart attack, we would have found her a bed. But because she had a mental health and a substance abuse issue, we turned her away. We, got, we stabilized her condition, back out on the street she went, and a few days later she was gone. Uh, that's not the way the law works. That's a disgrace. We failed that poor woman. And uh, we've got to do a better job ensuring that mental health parity really means what it's supposed to mean. And we've got to find beds for some of these people that need it for, for their substance abuse issues. I'm going to be an aggressive attorney general helping people that don't feel like they have an advocate, that don't feel like they have someone fighting for them. Uh, you know, in, in last year in the United States, there were 230 million prescriptions of opiates written in, in our country. Uh, you know, we only have 360 or so million people. So th this, this problem is getting out of hand, and we need someone you know, to go after that small number of doctors who, who are prescribing a large number of mm -hmm. pills, to force Big Pharma to, uh, to, to make these pills in, in tamper-resistant form, and also to educate our young kids in junior high and high school about the dangers of the opiate drugs. So th it's about leadership, Joe, more than anything else. Well, uh, coming up, of course, uh, in June, the... Uh uh, state Democratic Convention. How important is it for you to uh, to get the nod from them? Of course, there's a primary election, and that yeah. will ultimately decide. But uh, how important is the uh, the uh, Democratic uh, uh, endorsement? Yeah, you, you know, I've got it, and I've not got it when I've run before. <laughs> and uh, the day, a couple of days after, it makes little sense, uh, little difference to anybody. So I want to get my 15 percent. I think we'll both get 15 percent, and then. It's on to the primary, and, and really it's uh, less than three months after the, after the June uh, uh, convention is, is the primary, so it will really be a sprint at that point. And you're all ready for a long, hot summer? To I'm ready to work. You know, I'm not afraid. Of, I, I actually like people. I like campaigning, <laughs> so uh, I'm not afraid of going out there and shaking hands and meeting people and doing my best to convince people that if they want to have a proactive, progressive attorney general, someone will stand up and be in their corner. They should vote for Warren Tolman. Well, we want to wish you the best. My thank pleasure. you for coming back and Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Always us. a pleasure. Uh, uh, Warren Tolman, uh, also a, uh, well, uh, at least one person, TV personality of, of, uh, of note here. Uh, uh, also Hardly. A, uh, former, uh, former now analyst for... Uh, I did, yeah, I did Fox. I was on New England Cable News a lot. Uh, very busy. But, and with uh, Emily Rooney on Greater Boston. Yes. But my big claim to fame is having sat with Joe Heisman. That's, uh, that's, so. the, that's the truth. I, you know, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, uh, pleased to have you here, my as pleasure. always. Uh, best of luck to you. Thank you. Uh, and just a uh, program note, uh, we'll be having uh, the other candidates in this race uh, coming on in the uh, weeks and months ahead. Uh, uh, please have Warren Tolman uh, here tonight. And when we return with more of Talking to Neighbors, well, we'll shift gears to a... Uh, a very interesting local issue. Uh, could we have traffic gridlock in southwest Boston? Well, if you leave, uh, listen to Bernie Doherty, uh, that's a possibility. We'll find out what he and Bridging Forest Hills are all about when we return. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We're talking to the neighborhoods. I'm Joe Heisler, your host. And in the second half, while well, we shift gears to a local issue that is uh, raising some eyebrows some concerns, uh, we're talking about, of course, the state's plan to uh, tear down the Casey Overpass, Route 203, that uh, crosses over Forest Hill Station. Uh, the critics uh, contending it could result in gridlock for much of southwest Boston, at least during uh, the rush hours. And uh, joining me tonight, uh, one of those critics, and a uh, gentleman who's had his uh, finger on the pulse of... Uh, development, uh, certainly in this section of Jamaica Plain for quite some time. Uh, member, uh, he's a uh, Asaku Road uh, resident and uh, longtime activist in Jamaica Plain, and Bernie Doherty joins us. Nice to have you here. Nice Joe. to have you, Joe. Thank Thanks you for so having much. me here. Appreciate well, it. is that an overstatement uh, somewhat? You know, I mean, uh, uh, this is, first of all, tell us where the project is at. Is it a, uh, is it a done deal? The state uh, is talking about tearing down the Casey Overpass. Of course, anybody that travels the road knows it's in tough, tough shape. Sure. But uh, tearing it down and replacing it at grade level, uh, um, where are we at? Is it, uh, is it the project a go or? Well, it's a go as far as the state is concerned. They've put the, uh, you know, the RFP, uh, request for proposal, out on the street. 
and that is due back in on August the 5th, I believe it is. Uh, open the bids to get them on in. Well, they're in, and then they'll do a little due diligence. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll research those uh, quotes they get in, or the bids, whatever you want to call them, and out of that, they'll come up with uh, the party that they'll have uh, do the act, take down the bridge demolition, and then um, put in the surface roads. But as a done deal, to that part of your question, I don't believe anything's a done deal until the community says it's a done deal or it's actually built, and even then. In this case here, what you've said, you know, it, it could result in gridlock. Uh, the report that we have, I have here, which was the original engineering report that was done by for, uh, DCR, uh, which was done by the engineering firm there, um, and by a traffic consulting uh, firm, there's all the you know, level of counts, traffic, and everything else. They state on page 21 of that, uh, which I showed you earlier, that if you take the bridge out and do not restore it or put it back in, in some form or another, you're going to result in gridlock. Indeed, a report prior to that in 2004, which was done on the entire Admiral Necklace, Chapter 5, dealing with the uh, bridge at Forest Hills, the Monsignor Casey overpass, uh, also came to the same conclusion that they know, they said in the thing, I'm paraphrasing here, but that they would like to, there are, they know there are organizations out there that would like to see the bridge gone because it's in their claim it separates Arnold Arnold right. from Franklin Park, but to do so would again result in gridlock. So this isn't just a little neighborhood issue. There's never little neighborhood issues. It's uh, for many people the most important thing happening, uh, certainly if it affects their, their, uh, the quality of their life, their property values, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, this could have an impact or on on a large slice of uh, the city. That uh, well, how many how many cars traverse that uh, overpass uh, every day? Uh, if you I know every if time you look I at the uh, what they've got in here, it says twenty six thousand cars. What the mass dot has put out is twenty four thousand cars that go from east to west. Okay, and that's uh, traffic, just vehicles now. Uh, that do not want to go into Forest Hills. They want to because they want to go on into Jamaica Way and to the Back Bay, Fenway, you know, up on that area, Bri Alston, Brighton, Cambridge, and others. This will have an effect be beyond be just the people in Forest Hills. This is a major state route. It's the largest state route, main uh, roadway in the southwest portion of, of Boston, and it uh, takes traffic from Mattapan, Dorchester, Quincy, Braintree, and the South Shore, and brings it over to many of the technological and other things over in, the, in Cambridge and other areas, and vice versa, going in the other direction, uh, going down to the South Shore, going out, or Red Sox games, you name it, uh, you know, that happens over there. So uh, it is a major highway, and to do what they're doing now, I believe, is counterproductive to, you know, good transportation policy. Now, yet, not, yet they're going ahead with it. Uh, what's this? Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and help us to understand. Uh, mm -hmm. They're talking about replacing it with uh, four lanes at grade level, if I understand no. this correctly. It will be six lanes to seven lanes at grade level. Six to seven right. lanes, okay. You will have, starting at the cemetery, okay, basically where it goes from Forest, Forest Hill, Hill Street. Cemetery. Yeah, right there, right there. There's, uh, there's, that uh, there's a, uh, no, that's before the rotary. There's a set of lights there. But 100 yards down is the rotary. That will now become Shea Square. All those trees that are in there that were, you know, uh, very nice and everything else, over 80 years old, are going to be cut down now. So there's not going to be any more of that there. That's, they're just going to make it into a square. They believe it's the most safe way of doing things. You can take that issue. So no more road. rotary. No more rotary. Then you come on down the road, and you will have another traffic light about halfway down before you re reach Washington Street, uh, where there will be U-turns that will be taken. Uh, these are the two U-turns because they won't allow you to take left turns anymore, coming either uh, going east or going west. So you have to go into these, what they call a Michigan left. So you come down to that, and there's a traffic light at Washington and you know, coming across, Which and then there is there's there. a, a traffic light, yes, at, at South Street and uh, Upper Washington, and uh, then you go on. So what they're trying to say is that this will only add 30 to 90 seconds to your transit time. I find that hard to believe, and I think anybody who's traveled in, in, in traffic in the city of Boston or even through that area would find it hard to believe. Now, I'm going to play a little devil's advocate sure. here, and this is just what I know and uh, uh, from watching from afar, uh, more aesthetically pleasing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, more of a uh, uh, 
calming of traffic instead of uh, high-speed traffic. Um, well, and I, I guess the biggest is uh, that what what the cost would be to replace the Casey overpass, which would be uh, you know that's an expensive uh, project versus being able to build it at grade level. What do you say well, to Well, let me start first with your aesthetic. Report. More I'm thinking of the uh, bicyclists, uh, sure. you know. Uh, sure, bike pedestrians, bicyclists. Parkway effects, sure. you know. Uh, I mean, I've heard all those. I mean, yeah. believe me, and one would like to believe that's the case. And if you look at the, the plan, I don't have one right in front of me here at the moment, but I thought I did, um, where it shows you know, you have all these, I've always said, take those green pom-poms off because that's what it looked like. They have all these things coming down this six lanes, you know, and it's green here, green there. That's not the way it's going to be starting off anyways. But the reality is if people see the aesthetically pleasing, sure, if you took the bridge down, it's ugly. The bridge was, you know, a very nice looking bridge back in the, in the 70s and 80s. It had a nice brick wall on it and everything else. And because it, if you don't maintain something and you let it go to pot, it's going to be ugly. I've heard all the things from saying, well, you know, it's scary under there till it blocks the view of the sun, you know. So when you get down to it and you ask them about this aesthetically pleasing, what is more aesthetically pleasing about roads choked with cars and trucks and buses? Okay, is that more aesthetically pleasing? I don't think so. Even if it is only for the hours from six to nine and from four to seven, that's gonna be a real mess down there. And so that's not to me aesthetic pleasing. What was the second issue you had? I forgot that. Well, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, the, the parkway effect. It's, uh, you know, like uh, uh, these roadways were intended to be. They were, uh, you know, uh, uh, Fred Olmsted had, you know, what he was going to put that. Frederick Olmsted, you know, the Jamaica Way, sure. the uh, There's no doubt about uh, it. parkways. Uh, the bridge was, you know, the, the, the system, Restoring you know. the Emerald Necklace. Oh, yes, and, and it's all that, you know, okay? The fact of the matter is, that if you look at that roadway and you say, well, Fred, you know, uh, Fred Olmsted, Fred Olmsted, somebody put that in, was 1885. We didn't have any cars then. We didn't have buses, at least not what they are today. And we certainly didn't have trucks of the type they are today. Okay, so that kind of, that's at best misleading. Mm -hmm. and, and, and otherwise, it's just crazy. Okay, what you've got is, you've got a major roadway here. And the reason that, uh, the question that needs to be asked is, why was that bridge put there in the first place? And does that need still exist? And the reason it was put there is to alleviate the mass congestion that occurs at two major intersections with a major transportation facility on this uh -huh. side and a major bus storage and repair facility on the other side of it, okay? So when you take those three state entities and put them together, <laughs> I just don't see how you can say to somebody that that is going to work just as well. You know, I listen, you say the bicyclists, and you bring them into the conversation, I agree with you. Does it make sense for a bicyclist to have to travel across seven lanes of traffic, okay, versus four lanes of traffic with a bridge? I don't think it is. I think it's inherently more safe for somebody to go across two lanes, of four lanes of traffic than seven lanes of traffic. I think when you talk about the calming effect, calming effect on what? The fact that you've got cars, buses, and trucks sitting there? I can tell you as a driver, and you can tell me too. It doesn't have a calming effect upon me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm thinking, and, and I can't remember what the, uh, the incident was that happened. Um, and of course, I, 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 live, I travel through southwest Boston myself, so I'm aware of it. I, uh, but every single road uh, in Jamaica Plain was completely jammed, and I, I'm trying to think of what the incident was. Was this and the young people that were coming down on the other side of the Jamaica Way and came across the Jamaica Way and crashed? That's what yeah, it is. Yeah. And, 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 but the, the, the entire area was, was blocked off. Yeah. Now, yeah, uh, here's my question. Yet, this proposal won support. It's got uh, some uh, support from uh, 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 some local activists, not everybody feels the way you do. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, got one support from the state to uh, at least uh, some public officials, several public officials have uh, openly supported this. Uh, so what's kind of driving this? Is it, uh, you know, kind of a, a woolly-headed thinking of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, idealist uh, uh, liberals, and there's a few of those, and maybe more than a few in Jamaica Plain, and uh, I don't think uh, it has or is it, it 
really uh, more a case of, uh, you know, pencil neck accountants uh, that are looking at the bottom line and saying, this is the difference between this many million dollars and this many million dollars. Right. Well, let's, let me take this, uh, and it comes out, look. Th those who are supporting it, the Animal Neckers Conservancy, Bike Boston, Livable Streets, uh, Walk Boston, uh, the Arboretum Conservancy, um, they have, uh, the two conservancies, uh, and I'll take Emil Necklace, Emil Necklace has always been against the Casey uh, overpass being there because they really felt it divided, you know, it served as a barrier between people going from the Arboretum one to the Franklin other, Park. right. And I don't think that was the reason people didn't go into Franklin Park, period. I mean, you could walk on either side and be in Franklin Park or drive your car and get to Franklin Park. The reality is that when people start to talk about uh, woolly-headedness and stuff like that. No, they're not woolly-headed. They've got, but they are single-issue organizations. They come in, and one is, I want to get bike paths. The other one, I want walkable streets. The other one, I want livable streets. The other one, I want, you know, this connection. Mm -hmm. What they've done, in my opinion, is taken away from the community their voice. Because I believe early on in this process, when the WAG was going forward, the Working Advisory Group and that whole process, they loaded up those meetings with members. They have a membership list. They've got a full paint staff. We don't have that. We're working people and trying to get by in our lives, just like everybody else on the Forest Hills. So they loaded up those first, those few meetings in the beginning, because I can remember young people standing up and saying, I'm from a bike, and I'm from this group, or I'm from that group, and they're all talking about, but they're from Belmont. They're from someplace else. I'm not saying there aren't people in Jamaica Plain who very mm -hmm. feel very strongly that that bridge should come down and stay down. There are many people in Jamaica Plain who feel very strongly that that bridge component is necessary there. The other issue you brought up, cost. If you look at what the 53 million that it was going to cost to put the act rate is now up to 61, almost 62 million, okay? The bridge, some people said, was up around 73 million. So the difference between it would be about 11 million dollars, okay? I believe it's probably could be even less than that because what we're talking about here, if you put a bridge in, now the, the bridge is operating with one lane each way. Right. If you put a bridge in that's one lane each way and maybe a little buffer strip on the side for breakdown or something like that, or even you could make it a very nice bridge, but it would be 700 feet shorter because you don't have to go at the height you went to get over the MBTA and the, when it uh, was the, the elevated right. line. Yeah, well, the elevated line and also the New Haven Railroad and right. that. You don't have to go anymore. So it would be 16 and a half feet high in the middle and it would be, you know, half the width. So you could. <laughs> really, you could make a very attractive, very uh, useful uh, 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 transportation mode there versus what we had before. These groups that came in from the bike groups and others, you know, we spent more time talking about bicycle paths. We spent 40 minutes, this is the truth, 40 minutes during the uh, 13 meetings we had as a working advisory group talking about transportation. All the rest mm -hmm. was on What's it going to look for flowers? What's it going to look for here for green space? What are we going to have for sight lines? Where are we going to put the cabs? What are we going to do this, you know? It, nothing to do with the issue of transportation. Did the, uh, and yet, uh, you know, uh, many public officials are on board uh, with the state DOT uh, is on board with it. Uh, I'm assuming the Patrick administration is on board with this. Uh, they wouldn't be going forward. Some local elected officials are even on board with this. Yes, and. Uh, if, well, I was, what, if you what, and I were what, having this conversation 35 years ago, we'd be talking about I-95 coming through Boston, right? wouldn't we? Yes, How many pu public officials were on with that? If you and I were sitting, no, excuse me, 40 some odd years ago. If we, you and I were sitting here talking about the state lab and the uh, morgue for Eastern Massachusetts going up on the land where the state lab is right now, remember that one? Yeah. They told me, you're never going to beat it, Mr. Doherty. The community can't do it. There's a community garden there now. If they told us about the top hit, the top facility they wanted to put down on Hyde Park Ave, they told us that was a done deal too. No, it's when the people stand up and get the politicians' attention, bring them in and say, hey, look, listen to us, okay. the people have to live with it. We've got just a couple minutes. Sure. Are, are you, so, are you making any progress? What about the new mayor? Where's he at on this? Uh, what about the candidates running for governor? Because talking about the uh, I-95 uh, extension, of course, that ended in 1971, 72, when a new governor, Frank Sargent, was elected. That's correct. One of the first things he did is stop that project. What are they saying? And I 
is there uh, at this point any way of stopping this uh, realistically? I wouldn't be here talking to you if I didn't think there was a realistic way of stopping this. We are, I just met Mr. Tolman as he was leaving here uh, and he wants to sit down and talk. I met uh, Mr. Murray, uh, the new city councilor, I think it's Murray, I'm not sure, but uh, he wants to sit down and talk. You know, These are the way we have to, you know, I'm sure the other organizations will get in and talk. Mm -hmm. Now as far as the mayor is concerned, the mayor, I've met with him only once or twice. I've met with some of his people but not getting in to see him, and I wish he would listen to us and at least give us an opportunity. He's given all these other groups an opportunity to talk, uh, but we need to be able to talk to him and explain to him why we feel so fervently that this is the wrong way to go. We're not talking about, hey, uh, you know, stop the whole project, <coughs> but bring in the bridge component, or at least let the people and in the area make a decision. Is, uh, who has bridge, uh, bridging Forest Hills? Is it just a handful of people that, uh, you know, no, we have about a, we in have here, a thousand or? people who have signed our petition that's online. So no, it's a lot of people. We have people. We're getting uh, people uh, organized up in the four W's area of Forest Hills. We've got other. You know, our group is organized. Eighty percent of the people in my community signed a petition to put a bridge back in there. And and, and I understand. And and maybe uh, you know, uh, it's always development is always controversial. But this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, uh, there's uh, one thing, the impact of the project and the, it'll have on traffic, but uh, at the same time, there's all of these proposals uh, to develop new housing in this same area, which... It's well. a, I'm glad you brought that in. It's a development tsunami. I brought you a copy of this, uh, which is just the facts. But it's a development tsunami which is descending upon Forest Hills. Not just the KC overpass. You have the Hughes Oil with 289 mm -hmm. units there. You have the Flanagan Seaton with 134 units there. You have Parcel U up in Hyde Park Ave with 121 new units. Those are all on the books and ready why, to go forward. Why this area? Why this neighborhood? Why is it? And don't get me wrong, there's development going on all over. Yes, but sir, uh, yeah. there's an intensity. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the number of units being proposed uh, over five. It's 544 right now. But there are 500 and some 30 some odd more that would go in under the BRA proposals for the other lots. I believe it'll, that'll go up to a thousand, up to 1,100 units within the next 10 years, uh, within the next five years, very possibly, the 540 within the next five years. And you could probably see that go up to 15 or 1,600 because of the fact that they've allowed five stories here. Flanagan Seaton used to be 42 units, they mm -hmm. added 92 more units from the four stories onto there. Hard to say no, hard to fight, and we've got just a minute or two left to, yeah. to fight against projects like this, though, when, uh, when there's so much pressure on the housing market. And so many people are like yep. that need housing. Uh, hard to be a, a guy that always says no. No, it's not a question of, I'm not opposed to any of these. What I'm simply saying that is, that if we're going to do it, let's do it in a manner in which we are looking at the, the impacts not of the individual parts, but of the all of the whole upon that mm -hmm. community. This is not about stopping what it got. If you want to talk about affordable housing, nine hundred dollars a month is not affordable rents to me. But that's what they they're saying. Another one saying twelve hundred dollars a month. I, I don't know if people understand what the minimum wage in this country. It's seven dollars and twenty five cents. And even if you brought it up to ten ten, it'd be a little over four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. How do you tell somebody they've got to give you? And that's before taxes. How do you tell somebody they've got to give you their three weeks of pay in order to? to house their family. But you understand what I'm saying. Of course I understand uh, there's, there's, what you're saying. there's this incredible pressure. Well, there's incredible pressure because as the Globe has been talking about here, you've got 50,000 students who are not housed in dorms. They are taking up a lot of housing in the city of Boston. And what's going to happen is these ho this housing that's coming in, Joe, Joe, is not about housing that would go to working well, class people. And you may not be able to solve all of those, but um, you say no? Do you organize? At what point does the neighborhood push back? Well, I, I hope the neighborhood will push back in the sense that regardless of what happens on the Casey and all of this, is, they need to understand, the neighborhood need to understand, who do I go to if I have problems with rodents? Who do I go to if I have a problem with traffic? Who do I go to if I have a problem with construction time and noise and dust and, and go on and on and on? Do I have to go to each construction manager in order to make this work? Yeah, that's right. So let's get it done now. Let's take a sensible look at it. Let's put a hold on this for a bit and get a real study okay. done. And if, uh, again, uh, Bernie Doherty is uh, 
longtime neighborhood activist in Jamaica Plain. The organization is called Bridging Forest, Forest Hills. Hills. That's correct. If people want to get a hold of you or find out more about uh, these various uh, proposals. I apologize. I didn't bring with me anything, but they can contact me directly at bernard.doherty at comcast.net. Okay. And uh, if you can get that, it's oh. Bernard, B-E-R-N-A-R-D, D-O-H-E-R-T-Y. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, Thanks Joe. for coming in tonight. It's a pleasure. Again, you're watching Talking to the Neighborhoods here on the Boston Neighborhood Network. We're here tonight and every Monday night at the same time. Next week, uh, Senator Michael Rush joins us, as well as we'll get a look at the latest film from the Environmental Film Festival. R Dr. Ricky Stern from E! Inc. joins us.